it was kind of a very angry and like frustrating time of taking out all of my emotions on any dude that looked at me the wrong way, said something inappropriate or touched me without my consent. So I ended up getting into a lot of like conflicts and conversations with men that would end up in yelling and tears and emotions. And then no one would walk away from those conversations fulfilled. I would walk away with nothing. I'd feel even worse and they wouldn't have learned anything. But for me, that was my process to hold them accountable, stand up for myself. But then it wasn't until Australia year last, last year where I had my first positive experience talking to someone who said something inappropriate. And I was just like, Hey, dude, really calmly, this is my experience that made me super uncomfortable. And you maybe didn't mean for that to happen, but that's how it, that's how I took it. And then he was like, Oh, wow. Okay. I'm sorry. And I saw his face change and like, he understood that. And then I walked away from that and I was like, Oh my God, I did it. I figured it out. I can have these conversations and try to have like personal change or incite personal change. So that's kind of where I come into my title of building allyship with men to end sexual violence and harassment against women through challenging harmful masculinities. So, okay, global significance. We all know sexual violence is not a new issue and it goes beyond every social, economical and cultural boundary and reaches every country and community in different ways. One in three women worldwide experience some form of sexual violence. That is wildly disgusting and unacceptable. And then you look at the people who are the perpetrators of this violence and 95% of them are men. Why? is that there is something wrong with the current power structures that are in place that create these gender inequalities as well as harmful gender roles that perpetuate and condone violence against women. So to look into this issue on a deeper or more local level, I conducted my three month long case study in Byron Bay, Australia. And Byron Bay is a pretty popular laid back beach town during the day, but also has a very vibrant nightlife scene as soon as the sun goes down. And it also draws in a lot of visitors with one over 1.5 million people coming in throughout the year. And it just kind of centered my research, being able to meet so many people from different cultures and asking them what their views are on gender roles. So that kind of gets me into my main question of how can these notions of allyship be built to end sexual violence and harassment against women? So through this, my goals were to understand how different ideals and beliefs surrounding masculinity from different cultural and societal contexts were transformed into the acceptance of sexism and violence. And then more importantly, how these ideals and beliefs could challenge and can be challenged and to incite personal reflection leading to potential allyship. So then I also had a secondary question, which was how does alcohol use among the transient population increase the amount of sexual violence and harassment towards women? So as Byron Bay is pretty big in their nightlife, I also wanted to focus on the role of alcohol consumption in sexual violence and then kind of gather information for that. So the way I conducted my research was gathering data from a wide range of sources focused on my main themes. And then I also collected field notes where I observed and I observed and like kind of took note of all my experiences throughout Byron. So being with, I was like talking to someone or if I noted something on the street, I would take note of that. So everyday interactions. And then a majority of my field notes came from my two research sites, which were two popular bars in Byron Bay. And I chose these two bars just because I felt the most comfortable there. I had an already like established relationship with those who work there. So I knew if anything happened, I would be safe. And that was like the most important thing for me in doing this research. And then at these bars or these two research sites, I also had a lot of um, informal unstructured interviews, which can be noted as one-off interactions. And these were with men who would approach me and then I would disclose like my information or like my research topic and kind of take note of what their reaction was. 
And if the conversation continued, then I'd ask him about masculinity, all that good stuff that everyone wants to talk about on a night out. And then I also did participatory and non-participatory observation, where within these bar settings, I would notice different inappropriate and appropriate behaviors that were going on between men and women. And then I also conducted five formal semi-structured interviews with men who were currently living and working in Byron Bay. And these five men were from Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, and England. And I kind of chose them or they, I chose them because their position in Byron Bay as either bartenders or security guards, or they came up to me and expressed interest in the research. So yes, that's how I did that. And then I analyzed my data through thematic coding in my field notes and interviewing and my interview transcripts and separated them into four reoccurring themes of masculinity, culture, alcohol, and allyship. So when it comes to masculinity in, in my questions, the biggest thing is what does it mean to be a man? What does this masculinity thing mean? And then a lot of people had a lot of different answers, which makes sense because it varies from culture to culture and what you've grown up with. But then one of the biggest things was it's such an abstract concept where it just talks about having good character and being responsible for yourself and others. And that was probably like the best outcome of an answer I can ask for. So that was really good. And then I just added two of the quotes that I had, which I think kind of portrayed this in a really beautiful light. And on the other side, a lot of people kind of talked about the man box and the socialized pressures that men receive to perform masculinity and to perform what it means to be this gender through a certain lens. And if they don't, then they will be scrutinized or face repercussions from others, men and women alike. So one of the men like kind of brought me through his challenges with his physical appearance and how after a long period of time, he was going from being like too big to too small and he can never find that perfect societal balance. And that really limited his emotional health. And then masculinity for some people was also questioned at a young age, depending on what they were going through. So someone couldn't pre- one of the dudes couldn't protect his sister in the way that a brother could. So after that happened, he's like, well, what does it mean to be a man if I can't do those specific roles? And then in the little quote I had up top, one of the guys mentioned that when his parents separated, he was the man of the house. And then in his mind at a young age, he's like, well, what does it mean to be the man of the house? What specific roles does that have? So that was just really interesting to get a huge influx of answers for this. And then next, the cultural background that people come from. So within societal beliefs, I found that it was really interesting that people who came from pretty toxic environments or like cultural backgrounds kind of kept those beliefs as they were traveling or as you're traveling like started chipping away at that but that was their core value because that's what they learned and then within the upbringing I found that some people were mimic like would end up mimicking their family values in their future family and try to replicate that to have similar gender roles because that's what worked for them and that's what they wanted to see in the future and then I also found early exposure to violence had a pretty strong effect on what did it mean to be a man and what did it mean to like see those values in other people. And then one of the people that I interviewed talked about his early exposure to violence and how it increased his aggression at a young age. But then also as he got older and because of what he's seen, he started rejecting those because he saw the damage of what it did to his mother and his family. And he's like, this is something that I'm never going to be. I'm never going to let happen. So it was interesting to see how that also kind of placed the platform as a good ally and how someone can use their experiences like that to then benefit the people who experience it. Oh, wrong way. Wrong. There we go. So then within alcohol, I kind of wanted to look at what the men or like the experiences of its effects. And as everyone knows, people who consume alcohol, kind of lose their inhibitions. And 
kind of think that there's acceptable behavior. And specifically within the bar setting, um, a lot of the bartenders or security guards notice that because Byron is such like a fun town, like you go there for vacation, no one thinks that there are repercussions for their actions. So people come into these spaces and do really inappropriate things because they don't think about the afterwards and alcohol gives them the encouragement to do that. But I, it's also really hard or it's been really hard to kind of conclude my findings within the alcohol setting because you don't know what people are like when they're not drinking. You don't know like how much they've had to drink. So all of those results were kind of just like from what I've seen and what these interviewees have seen. So that kind of like makes it a little interesting. And then I get into allyship. So when talking about allyship, a lot of people didn't really know what that meant. They didn't understand the term men as allies to women. So I kind of figured out I needed to explain it in a different way or like introduce it in a way that they'd understand. So that was really interesting how they haven't heard that term before. And then when it comes to being a feminist, as you can see, alternative motives. I don't know if any of you have experienced someone saying that they were a feminist, then later on doing things that were pretty wacky or whatever, specifically within men. And there was, there's a pretty prominent female figure in Byron um, who kind of combats sexual violence. And she told me, in a conversation to be wary of those who claim to be feminist because they're just going to try to do it to get into your pants. I was like, what? That's crazy. That's why would people do that? And then a few days later, I had that same experience where someone was so talking so highly about women and being like, this system is messed up. Like women need to be respected. And then later on, he came up and said like some pretty off putting things to me. And I was like, what's happening? Yeah, so that's something that I found. And then also bystander intervention is men are more likely to intervene if they know the person the thing is happening to, if the thing that's happening is worth it. So if it's big enough and captures all the attention, then yes, they're going to say something. And then also what the consequences would be after. If they went in and said something knowing that there was going to be a fight to follow, then they wouldn't do it. But it also shows that with the right knowledge and understanding, like you can build that bystander intervention through education. And also after interviews, I found that people, my interviewees were really willing to learn and reflect on what it is that we talked about. And that I think was the most positive outcome is that they can have this time to see their past and their actions and be like, okay, maybe it's time to change. And for discussion, yeah, there are so many versions of masculinities, which means that each conversation needs to be tailored depending on who you're talking to and you have to understand their background and if you want to create change with men as solutions then you need to like it needs to be so individually tailored to every person which makes it really difficult which is why I want to focus more on personal transformation rather than group setting and hope that it just trickles out and then I also it was really interesting to find that there were conflicting views to actions so one of the men that I had a conversation with from Argentina, he grew up in a very like uh, sexist kind of background, but then, and like he exposed those to me, like in a conversation, I was like, oh, interesting. You don't like being friends with you or being like interacting with you, I would have assumed, but then learning that, that those were his background beliefs, I was like, okay. And then he turned out to be a really important person for me in a bar interaction where he was the ally to step in. And then he noticed what was happening and he kind of came in and stopped it. And I was like, okay, so if you have these societal views that doesn't necessarily link to the actions that you're going to do. And then also bar settings, promoting masculine norms, men thinking that they're entitled to sexual favors if they buy you a drink, if you're talking or if you're dancing. So it's just kind of looking at how we can change, like make bar settings more appropriate for everyone. 
And then the limitations that I faced were time restraints. It was only three months. And also with the constant change of people in Byron Bay, it's so hard to get people to sit down for a conversation if they're not working there or currently living there. And then also the one-off interactions that I had were so colored by that setting and by how I presented myself, how they presented themselves. So it's really hard to gather information not knowing the rest of their story or how they would behave outside of that setting. And then also language barrier, because there were so many people from other countries speaking a lot of different languages. I was limited to only being able to talk to those who knew English well enough to have a conversation. So, yeah. And then in conclusion, allyship is so possible through individualized approaches and having the patience to like talk to someone and giving them the tools to understand that their past backgrounds or their norms on gender roles can be challenged, like giving them the questions to ask and then sitting down with reflection. And then there just needs to be more education on gender roles, like from an early age, just learn that this is all fluid and we don't need to be confined to these terrible boxes. And yes, those are some of my key references. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Jesse, Jess, uh, Jessica Herbert, thank you for your brave, and I mean brave in many senses of the word, but brave in that you're, uh, you're finding new solutions and putting yourself on the line in, uh, in conducting your research. So amazing. Um, can, uh, um, I think we already have uh, questions going forward um, in the chat, but uh, if in the meantime, you can also share your, um, your LIU Global email um, or, or another preferred email in the chat so that people can continue this uh, dialogue with you offline. Uh, we already have questions. So this one is from uh, Tara. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you explained or redefined allyship for those who may not have heard the term before or understood it in the way that you intended? Yeah, so when I first, one of my first questions is, what do you think of men as allies to women? And then a lot of people were like, um, what do you mean? Aren't we already allies? And I had to then go into being an active ally. So mm -hmm. say, when you see something that's inappropriately happening to a woman, you're going to say something. Like when you're friend, you're going to stand with them in this fight. And that's how I kind of defined allyship where after they saw, oh, it means taking a more active role. Okay, I understand that now, if that makes sense. So you were also educating them, as you said, uh, as, as well as uh, defining their terms. I don't think I was. That would, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, Okay, you're getting lots of thanks and exclamation points. Uh, you have a question from uh, Sunka, which is, can we book you for a spot in our uh, fall orientation? So you've got your first speaker's request. And then how are you planning to move forward with this work after graduating? Um, I would love to continue this and kind of figure out what my role as a female can be in male education groups and facilitating those conversations specifically within college settings because college in the States is like the spot for rape and sexual assault. And there needs to be more educations in place to like combat these. So I would love to be involved with that somewhere. Yeah. Oh goodness. Uh, so, so really in the States. Okay. 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 Wonderful. So you're really, this is the way you're also uh, to get another uh, question uh, in there. You're moving from those individual conversations to trying to make more structural uh, change and more uh, kind of, kind of have it be scaling it a little bit by, uh, by doing this kind of work. Um, how do you continue that? Um, like, and I'm, I'm just thinking about how do you take the, the power of the one-on-one -on -one conversations and the great vulnerability of that and and begin to scale it, you know, to because this is amazing work cool. you did. How do we scale it? How do you scale it? That's an interesting question. So I would hope that the groups like in the future or, or any education group would be working in a small scale, like maybe have like a close knit group, 10 to 15 people where everyone can still be vulnerable with each other, but it's not as much pressure 
and also providing the tools for people to get emotional if they don't know how to do that. And if that's not how they were raised to provide these emotions, then providing those tools to like have emotions outside so people can still get vulnerable without it feeling uncomfortable and invasive. I don't, okay. I don't have a lot of thoughts up here, but I don't know. If that's, no, that's, that's, that's good. Yeah. That's, um, okay. So we have a, a last question, I think, from Reiner. You said that masculinity comes in many different shapes and forms. Do you think this is true for femininity as well? Um, you know, uh, or is being a female more universally shared identity? Um, so that's from Reiner. Yeah. Well, within my research and finding that masculinity is so fluid, I think the same happens with femininity. Like you have these scales of extreme and extreme and everywhere in between, like you can fall and that doesn't necessarily, like it also can change throughout your life. Like you can perform, like performing gender is also learned as much as it is like ingrained into us, but also it's something that you choose to do. So yeah, I don't know. So I think there are also a lot of different versions and aspects to both masculine and feminine natures. Okay. Well, thank you again. I mean, this is just, again, uh, extraordinary um, presentation. Hi, everyone, and good afternoon. I hope everybody is having a great day. And and keeping safe. My name is Julia Rossoff. I'm going to talk about a case study I did while studying and living in Vienna, Austria. This case study investigates access to quality education programs for refugee youth. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, why I was interested in this topic. It started when I was, I was traveling abroad in Northern Europe and I was I decided to stop and, and eat at a Vietnamese restaurant and this stranger came and sat next to me and started talking to me about the safety of the city and how they felt it was the safest city in Northern Europe. But the only thing to look out for was the violence that broke out in the immigrant communities. And I thought, here we are sharing this really beautiful meal in a Vietnamese restaurant and you're going to tell me that that's how you feel. So even though it's a little off base from looking at, you know, education programs, I felt that, you know, how are schools addressing the needs of refugee youth and, and how are we moving forward with that, with that where communities like that are, are facing influxes of, of refugees. So, you know, not to move on. Oh, look, here we go. Now to move on for, uh, with a little background information, solidifying the importance of this topic. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees states that globally over half of refugees are identified of, as youth under the age of 18. The UNHCR has stated that these children fleeing their homes due to violence, a breach of human rights or civil, civil war and other conflict often struggle to feel represented and included in new academic environments and curricula. A very valuable quote that I came across in a report done by the UNHCR references how important it is to invest in our children of the future, that it is vital to nourish every single child, especially those where resolution has not yet come to their home country. And, and one last thing to mention, as it applies to all those pursuing an academic career, that access to quality education is a fundamental right and is ultimately key to any transition into a new uh, country. So moving on to some key ideas and literature that I focused on while developing my case study, I wanted to look at four points. The first one is that education should reflect that of society's needs. It should come from the ground up and be more community-based. It is also essential that schools include classes that help in maintaining and learning first languages. The literature also supports educators receiving appropriate training, both in empathy and diversity. The last point, and maybe the strongest, is that quality education should operate as a fabric, like we see in this diagram. The effect does not intend to showcase that quality education is balancing between these seven points, but it reflects that it can change depending on the context and how one must anticipate when those changes in balance should be made. 
So knowing all of this, ultimately, the research question that I developed was how are the programs run by Volkshule Varenskasa addressing the needs of refugee youth? So to talk a little about the setting where the research took place, I had the great opportunity to intern at a primary school in Vienna in the second district called Volkschule Varenskasa. The school itself advertises itself to be an ecology-based school, which means that they teach with an emphasis on environmentalism. The school also uses concepts from Montessori and Frenet, which emphasize practical life skills and working collaboratively. I want to share a little bit about the internship itself. I was brought into the school to teach English as a second language, and I'll be honest in saying that I hadn't been informed of my position there until the first day working. I wasn't vetted in any way and furthermore didn't receive the appropriate training to be teaching English as a second language, especially when I didn't have a grasp on German. So. The teachers didn't seem to mind this factor, and so I adapted. I, I brought in a ukulele, and I taught English through song in the 10 different classrooms. But I thought that that really spoke to some of the fundamental work that was done in my research about how functioning academic environments should be. And then additionally, I wanted to share that this school is actually pretty, or is pretty well known in the community for its inclusive learning environment. So to talk about some of the methodology, I collected data through participant observation within the classroom when I was teaching or when I was facilitating with another teacher or going on field trips. Additionally, I jotted things down and kept a, a field journal that I referred to every day. Uh, I interviewed five teachers and utilized information from casual conversation. I really wanted those environments to feel as informal as possible to ensure comfort from the interviewees and build that rapport. I also conducted bibliographic research that supported my findings. So my findings themes. After coding and combing through my data, I found four themes. I asked a variety of questions to my interviewees, which led to the, their ideas of pedagogy in the school, what each educator felt quality education was, what the programs were for refugee youth and, and how successful they were. The educators mentioned a variety of ideas in quality education, such as providing spaces for youth to form free thought, be self-motivated, get the education their individual capabilities require, and to furthermore have a facilitator that is supportive of all of those. So the national curriculum of Austria requires that refugee youth or migrant students be in, in separate classes learning German for two years before introduction into the learning environment with other Austrian students as stated by one of my interviewees. But what makes Volkschule Werensgasse different from other primary schools in Vienna is that they don't abide by the national curriculum in this way. They prefer to have refugee or migrant students learning German through socialization with German speaking students within the classroom because one learns better from immersion. The students also have classes which support first languages and home culture by teachers who are from the same country as those students. They get taken out of class to have these sessions for maybe one to two hours a day. There are also mental health support services, but those are for the whole student body and um, work on a first come first serve. The, there's also something I wanted to reference that, you know, the value of multiple forms of, of data collection yield different kinds of information. For example, I, would, I found something through observation and casual conversation that I didn't get from my interviews. And, and this was the biggest thing that um, while I was teaching um, English as a second language, I, I found that there was a lack in, in teaching and modeling positive social 
uh, interactions with other educators. For example, while I was teaching a class to fourth graders, an Austrian born student pointed to a refugee student's name on a list and said, this is a bad name. Uh, I will say that the, in place of bad, there was a swear word used, but I don't, you know, for the purpose of this presentation, I don't want to reference it. Uh, the refugee student could not understand what the other student was saying about them because they didn't have a grasp on English as they were still learning German as a second language. When this was brought up to the teacher, there was a shrug and a remark that those things happen all the time. Uh, the teacher also mentioned that some of the students had stated that they didn't want to sit next to particular refugee students in the class. And when I asked what was done about this, uh, the teacher mentioned, unfortunately, this class is just an unhappy mix. Uh, the same educator once said to me, you know, this Austrian born student will have all the advantages in life because he is a male who speaks German and English and has blonde hair. And the teacher stated that the refugee student in the class will have all the disadvantages just because of their status. So in light of those findings, I, you know, programs at the primary school are very supportive of first language maintenance and second language learning. Each ed educator expressed that refugee students are being supported in language learning and they see this progress by the end of the year. Additionally, with classes and maintaining the mother tongue, students are able to converse and learn more about their home co culture, which speculation may have it is not common and doesn't really occur in every public school in, in Vienna. If funding would permit, emotional, academic, and lingual support could be given to students for more than a couple hours per week. But that being said, there is still staff giving time to those who may need extra help in the classroom, getting lessons explained in the mother tongue, some mental health support as well if there are, are students that are facing issues with trauma. Um, the school and its educators have recognized the importance of engaging new students with others who speak German. Um, fluently as soon as possible, but it, it, as it is better to have refugee youth engage with other students, to hear and learn from them one-on-one uh, -on -one and, and hear it. They do have classes like that they get taken out of for one to two hours that are grammar and vocabulary, but again, the classroom environment with other students is an excellent space for students to socialize and get acquainted without falling behind in learning. Again, if a teacher notices that there is a social disruption between Austrian students and refugee students in the classroom, especially at the primary level, this should be addressed immediately to close the gap between students. So if a teacher understands that there is a disparity, it is up to the institution to address the ways in which schools can facilitate mutual respect between students as this will only perpetuate if not challenged and corrected. So these are just some brief uh, suggestions that I had for further study. A comparative study of um, an examination of how classroom teachers behave when addressing issues of social disparity, a data analysis on how inclusive the curriculum is for students coming from other countries, a study of how teachers' personal pre prejudices, prejudices sublimity, subliminally enter the classroom setting, a study identifying what policies are in place that address issues of diversity sensitivity, and ultimately an intervention study which introduces diversity awareness tasks and exercises exercises to improve both teacher and student appreciation of diversity. So some limitations were that, you know, I was not fluent in German. I didn't have direct access to any school-based statistics because I did not speak German. That was something that the headmistress didn't want to share with me. Um, and ultimately I was unable to compare with other schools in the district. But knowing all of that, um, I do want to conclude by saying that, yes, you know, the, the integrative programs at the primary school are providing support to refugee youth who are learning German as a second language while in the midst of maintaining their first language, that there is positive feedback by educators surrounding the programs and 
within the primary school, the programs are working to achieve the desired educational outcomes of the national curriculum, but there is this missing piece in the social integration that educators could have a stronger influence over. If we were to go back to that figure in the previous slides, um, the fabric of quality education, we might see that there was a response to the needs of migrant youth, but they were behind in addressing diversity issues between Austrian children and refugees. They also don't have much accountability, which I didn't really reference before, but they told me that they don't really have anyone coming in and, and looking at how they're administering these programs. And they don't have someone that's comparing their curriculum to other schools in the district. They just have someone looking at final test scores to see how students are performing. Um, so Volkshula Verensgasse has taken the first steps in engaging their student body on a basic or macro level of inclusivity, but there is still a learning process to be had in understanding and implementing the specific aims, which are diversity and inclusivity, the school reaches to make on a daily classroom or, or micro level basis. And, and ultimately education is not simply a product made for society to consume. It's, it's definitely more useful, in my opinion, after this research to visualize it as a flexible fabric that shifts as society shifts and changes to meet the needs of a diverse population with how our world is, is moving and functioning today. So that was in brief what I looked at for my case study in fall. And I just like to say thank you to everyone listening and I'll answer questions now. And also if I don't get to your questions, you can contact me here or take a peek at my LinkedIn through this QR code, but I will open up the floor. Let's see. Thank you so much, Julia, for fascinating and uh, measured um, uh, presentation. Yay. And you can do little hands there or virtual, actual hands. But um, uh, please uh, feel free to ask questions. There are two ways we can ask questions. One is to just type it in the chat if you feel comfortable doing that. Or you can also unmute your mic and um, ask the question and uh, that way and then mute your mic again after uh, you are done with that, if we're capable, if we're able to do that. Um, okay, okay, so are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, Julia, if um, the experience um, may have revealed structural, structural discrimination that that what you were observing in terms of um, the lack of responsiveness to the diversity and how to facilitate interactions, how much that may have also represented a deeper cultural dynamic. And did has this made you think about how this actually is occurring here in the US and what does this mean? You know, how on one level something can seem, have very positive dimensions and yet carry uh, difficult discriminating attitudes that whether spoken directly or unspoken impact interaction and learning. That's a wonderful question. Yes, um, to reference the second point, that is definitely something I'm investigating for my senior thesis of how that's working in the United States particularly, because I am interested in how policy, there is policy development, but how is it Im implemented? Is it actually being implemented? Are we seeing positive results? And I do think at the school in um, Vienna, you know, because this was the school that I did my research in, that it is structural because of, of the casual conversations I had with educators there. There were, there were ideas of, of the population in the community that I think were, which is why I, I said suggestions for further study of how 
teachers may have their bias influence their curriculum because there, I think there were issues that were coming across in the classroom from personal bias. I'm not sure if I missed, what were your other points in the question? Well, there's the, the there are multiple, I think there are multiple dimensions when we talk about a curriculum. Mm. So a curriculum can, can move on one level, but bias or attitude, belief systems, belief structures, and how do they seep through in terms of a word usage or a comment or a gesture uh, or creating an atmosphere of a particular, in a particular way. And, and what I was saying is how, how might your experience in Vienna be sensitizing you to some of what goes on here in the U.S. And yeah, I mean, yeah, that this is that's something that I again have have been investigating. How, how much? Pardon me. We have a dog in the house. Um, how? how much influence does an educator have in shaping the values of our students? You know, on the one hand, students spend so much time, maybe, you know, more time in schools than they do at home. And is, what is the balance of that and not taking away that structure from families? But if we're seeing, you know, young people going into the world with these perceptions and it's not very respectful or inclusive, how much does a teacher have influence over that? And, and what are the ways that we can have influence over that in the academic system? Because I, I do think there are ways of balancing those, those values without imposing your personal beliefs as an educator. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I would, I personally would love to investigate further stemming from this research that was done in Vienna, especially in the U.S. now that I'm here and wanting to pursue this further um, in an advanced degree. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to investigate that further in the U.S. Excellent. Uh, so, so this also goes directly to Zainab's question. What are your plans for the future in terms of staying involved in educational policy? It sounds like you want to really go on a policy approach. And if you can talk about that, uh, yeah, and how that might also um, uh, uh, speak exactly to the kind of structural uh, is issues that Lynn was addressing. Yeah, my my plans for the future in terms of staying involved, I, I, I hope to um, apply to graduate school for an MPP in, in uh, education policy and potentially curriculum development. I would love to be a part of policy development and implementation, especially in the public school setting. Um, I know, you know, it can be difficult coming from my personal background in education. I, I never went to public school, but I can still recognize the experience that I had. And why should that be any different from why, you know, why should there be a separation in the experience that I had in those in public school settings? So I'm hoping to have a background in education policy so I can take that uh, passion much further. Wonderful yeah. and make systemic change. So thank you. And you've gotten some praise here from Britt. Hello, Britt. Julie, this was awesome. I love your presentation and your thoughtfulness around this topic. We cannot wait to see you uh, go out into the world and uh, make change. Thank you. Um, thank you. And uh, Nora, it's, it's your turn now to also, uh, we have a little theme on education here. And Nora uh, also looked critically at education as um, did, uh, as will um, Roshane. So Nora? Wonderful and wonderful to while you're getting your presentation up. Sarah Moran, wonderful to the wonderful world of educators. So great you'll be dedicating your professional life to this.